For Krima Media's Policy, I'm Sane Lamini. Joining me today is Nadia Kemis to discuss her book titled Off Center and Out of Focus, Growing Up Colored in South Africa. So Nadia, the book details the struggles of being a colored person in South Africa during apartheid. What prompted you to tell your story? Well, um, Sane, this journey started about 10 years ago, and I was a mother of two teenagers then who were supposed to be growing up in a free South Africa. And I was constantly being asked to fill in their race on forms at school or for sports. And of course, there were also incidences of racism that were making the press on a regular basis. And I think it started a journey of me trying to make sense of race and identity and belonging. And, um, you know, I've always rejected the label colored. I consider myself a human being. I'm a South African. And, um, you know, coming from the Biko generation, if uh, I wasn't white, that meant I was black. And colored was very much a, an apartheid construct. And it basically, according to their def definition, anyone who didn't fit into white or native, as the Population Registration Act said, they were the coloreds or the leftovers, and um, and they and they tried to create this um, myth of of a coloured race. So um, I'm an occupational therapist um, by profession, but I, I went back to university and did a master's in creative writing, and somehow it turned into a PhD. I think when I realised that. I didn't know that much about my own history and the history of the country. And also, I had this vision that I was going to start writing about my grandmothers who were born before apartheid. And I realized I had to go right back to slavery, which shaped this country um, fundamentally. Our attitudes to race and sex came um, from slavery and colonialism. So I completed the PhD and then I... Um, graduated in 2019 and then COVID happened and I lost my father uh, to COVID and uh, many of the stories that I had been working with and exploring and the photographs that I'd used for the book and the thesis um, had come from his experiences of growing up in District 6. And, we, you know, we couldn't mourn him properly. We couldn't have a funeral. And and for me, it was a way of, of honoring him. And I sat down and I converted this thesis into, into the book. And it was important to do that because I, I had always wanted it to be out there to start a conversation. And um, with the thesis being being um, on the library, university library bookshelf, it wasn't accessible to many people. And so that was the the motivation for writing the book. And in the beginning of the book, you also talk about your, your father protesting against going to District 6 Museum because he said he lived through that era anyway. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I had tried for a long time um, to take him there because I thought it would it would help facilitate some um, sharing of memories because very much people spoke about the, of course, the hardships came out, but, you know, it was a lot about the music and the food and, and that kind of atmosphere. It was this very diverse community in District 6, um, but people didn't really speak about the forced removals, the humiliations of, you know, not being able to go to school or study what you wanted or to marry who you who you wanted to. And so I thought that would be a good place to take him. And he, he protested for a long time about that, you know. He said, I know it, I don't need to go through it again. And, you know, as, as soon as I walked into the museum with him, there, there were a number of, of things that happened. Um, the museum is very much a, a repository of memorabilia. Um, most of the items in the museum come from former residents. So um, for him, it was a, a familiar space. It was as if he was going into neighbors or families 
um, houses and spaces. And one of the first things that, that happened when we came in was that um, they asked if he was a former resident. And because he was, he was invited to sign the guest book. And I think that was just so hugely affirming that I, I, I could see him, him proudly signing that book. Um, and then as we walked through the museum, he started recognizing photographs and um, his, his standard five class teacher, his rugby club, Caledonian Roses that he played for, he recognized that. The posters with recipes of traditional food and he just became completely absorbed in that and got more and more animated. And my dad was a very quiet, reserved person. And um, one of the, well, he's no longer the, a guide. He's retired now, Nuri Brian. He was also District 6 um, former resident. And he came over to chat to my dad. And, you know, it just opened up all these memories. And afterwards, we, we sat down and had tea and... I start the book with this, with you know, with this quote from him of this memory of him taking my mother on the first date to the bioscope, and she was only allowed to go to the matinee because she was, you know, still still young, and um, and it, yeah, it just unleashed all these memories. So I'm I'm very happy that I got to do that with him. And you've touched on the issue of uh, COVID-19 having robbed you and your family of celebrating his life properly. But in the book, you said something along the lines that COVID also mimicked both slavery and apartheid. Tell us about that. I think there, there were many moments, I think, you know, the restrictions that we were placed under um, during COVID, um, the restrictions on movement, not being able to go places not being able to to gather and celebrate um, special occasions and to mourn um, deaths, which had these echoes of slavery for me on how controlled people who were enslaved um, were. And, and especially the fact that, um, you know, the slaves who were brought here by the Dutch came from Indonesia, Southeast Asia, and many of them were Muslim but it was against the law to practice Islam here. Yeah. And only the Dutch Reformed Church was allowed. So people, you know, got together secretly and practiced religion. It was a way of, of uniting people from different backgrounds, um, but they had this religion in common. And it, it's important for people to have some kind of spiritual um, community, something to belong to, um, a place where we can celebrate and mourn, you know, you know, births and deaths and and so on special occasions, and so it it very much reminded me, and I think because I was sitting and writing by myself under lockdown like everyone else, it it very much um, got me into that space of yeah. And you also speak about your grandmother who was never keen to go out on her own. Why, why was that? I'm not sure exactly, Sana. You know, you, you couldn't really ask, ask the grandmothers many questions. You were meant to be seen and not heard. Mm. And I, I, I don't know if it's because she came from, you know, from the country when she was very young. She came from Marmesbury where she'd grown up. Um, well, she'd lived there till she was about 14 or 15, and then both parents died. And and she and her three younger siblings got sent to live in Cape Town with um, an aunt, also in District 6. And and then she had to go out to work, and she worked in a, in a cigarette factory, in the Cavalla cigarette factory in Woodstock. And I think... That probably that sort of beginning of you know being thrust in out into the world and without any parents etc probably shaped a lot of that and and always very fearful of of us and us going out. Um, but there was also another side. I mean, our our parents, grandparents especially, they were afraid. Um, we were living in a police state basically, and they were afraid of breaking the law, of doing the wrong thing, of going where you weren't supposed to be going. 
Um, and I think that very much shaped, shaped her outlook on, on life. They were very afraid that we would get involved politically and, uh, you know, you had to do that quietly as well because they were worried that you were going to be locked up, etc. In fact, I was once arrested during the defiance campaign in 1989 and I didn't know how I was going to tell my parents and grandparents that I'd been in jail. And um, at the time, the newspaper, the Cape Times, was publishing the names of people who were being arrested because it was being done on a daily basis and it was a way of, of keeping track of, of who was arrested. And um, and I, I was arrested and landed up in, in a cell at um, Caledon Square with one of my teachers from high school, uh, an Irish nun, <laughs> And she taught me mathematics. And um, when I was released, I, I, you know, I said to my parents, I sat them down. I said, "You know who I saw recently, <laughs> Sister Anya." And so, you know, it's, I think that was a way of just softening the blow. Yeah. And in, in chapter eleven, you raised that uh, the role of education, which was very interesting for me at the time, was to instill discipline and good manners but uh, at the same time girls were were only taught for the explicit reason of uh, providing christian wives for young men yeah we we had a christian national education um during apartheid and so it was very much tied up with the church it was very much tied up with respectability and decency and um and the schools and the churches were were a way of of imparting that um that discipline and when i speak about the girls who were educated that it was a little bit before my time because i went to zonnebloom girls school in district 6 and and Zonnebloom was started by the Anglican Archbishop Gray, the same um, Archbishop who started the private schools, St. Cyprian's and, and Bishops um, in Cape Town. And that was obviously um, reserved for whites mm. uh, at the time. They opened up the school um, to, to invite girls so that these young men then had Christian wives. Um, that was... Uh, before my time, so probably like the, I think the late nineteenth century when Zona Bloom was started. Um, but I mean, even when we were there, it was very much about discipline, about how how you should behave and how you should dress, and you know, girls weren't young ladies weren't allowed to eat in public, so we had to bring our lunch and sit down at our desks and eat our lunch and um, th those kinds of of things, yeah. And now fast forward to your time, uh, you talk about the humiliation of having to apply to the Department of Colored Affairs to attend now the university after being the first person in your family to complete metric. Yes. You yeah. say in the book it was not easy at all, as you were not even allowed to treat white patients. Tell us about that and other issues that you faced uh, because of your skin color. So um, I chose to study occupational therapy. Um, I have a younger brother and sister who had learning disabilities. And I remember very clearly how my parents struggled to get them help. I mean, it was it was not freely available or you know to people who were who were not white. And I remember them spending many hours and many months, you know, trying to to find the correct therapy. And I think that influenced my choice of, of studying occupational therapy. And uh, the University of Cape Town offered it. And because it was not offered at the University of the Western Cape, which was the University for Colored People, I was allowed to apply there and then um, was accepted. And I was good enough academically, but this, you know, my outer body, my skin color um, was this representation of inferiority and, had, and I had to apply to go there. And it was a huge cultural shock, first of all, because suddenly there I was surrounded by so many white people. <laughs> And, uh, you know, 
I was allowed to sit next to them in class. I was allowed to sit next to them in the library. But off campus, you know, we um, we couldn't go see a movie together or eat in a restaurant or, or play sport together even. Um, so that was big for me. I think also coming from a, a school on the Cape Flats where we didn't have many resources, to suddenly be on this huge campus. Um, it, was a, it was a different world. And then even though UCT um, had this quota system to allow people who are not white to attend, um, we, we very much felt that we, you know, we didn't belong. And there were little things or seemingly little things like when it came time to treat patients that I was not allowed to treat um, white patients. Um, even in a in a psychiatric um, clinical practice where I didn't have to touch anybody, I was not allowed to to practice. Uh, in in our second year, we studied anatomy and we had a cadaver that we dissected to learn about the human body, and we were not allowed to have a white body, even though you know this person was now dead. This wasn't a dead body. We were not allowed to do dissections on this body. Um, so there, there were many things like that that reminded us constantly um, of, of where we we were supposed to fit. Mm. And you you also say your only a recollection of being closer to white people in your family was when your parents had relations. Can you tell us about that? Because I remember reading that you also had to dress uh, to impress them in a way. I think the, the dress to impress, I think, was a, a general way of us being brought up that, our, you know, um, the apartheid government controlled every aspect of our lives, and but our mothers controlled our home, and they were determined that we would be represented properly, we would dress properly, we, we would send a certain message that we were respectable and decent. And even though we might not have sleek hair or um, thin lips and, and fair skin, that we were respectable. And um, so there was a lot of emphasis on how on how we dressed and, and how we looked and, um, and, and the house being cleaned and um, spring cleaned and uh, and prepared every weekend for you know someone who might possibly <laughs> come and visit and so that there was no shame um, mm. in how the people were being received. Um, as far as as family was concerned, I, I write about my um, my mother's cousin who got married to um, a man from Rotterdam, and so. This was in, in the late 1950s, and they, of course, they couldn't get married here. They had to get married in the Netherlands because they, they were breaking a number of laws, the Immorality Act, the Mixed Marriages Act, the Group Areas Act, because they wouldn't be able to live together here. And so in the beginning, I mean, they, they would try and come and visit as, as often as they could, but it got more and more difficult when the children were born because the children were then considered to be white. And so if my aunt came to visit um, with the children, she was not allowed to stay in her mother's house because that was a colored home in a colored area and these were white children, so she couldn't stay with them. And and after a while, you know, her husband stopped coming as well because um, he couldn't mix and go out with his brothers-in-law in Cape Town. And then, and then there are a few, few incidences of other people, you know, who... Where they, they, there was marriage across the color line, as as they say, and and the difficulties that came with that, yeah. And sadly, we still have issues of segregation uh, that persist in various ways even today. Why do you think our country is still dealing with the racial cut even in twenty twenty three? Sane, I think that you know we we haven't sat down and really addressed the issues you know that we should have done and we um we were urged suddenly 1994 happened and we were told now apartheid is over get on with it um but apartheid is not over and yes we still are very segregated country because we haven't done the work we had the truth and reconciliation committee but that dealt with you know gross human rights violations 
and um, the smaller things of you know of of not being able to get married to who you wanted to the daily things of of having to tell your children oh no you you can't go to that beach because you know that's for whites only or um not being able to pursue a sporting career that you would have liked to those everyday things when you know they they built up a resentment and it needs to be spoken about acknowledge the pain and the and the trauma of that time and we need to acknowledge it and not because we want revenge but to say this is what happened um i'm sorry this happened to you let's see you know see how we can live better together and i i really believe that until we've had those conversations that um we we can't move forward and writing this book was my way of contributing to a conversation of my way of saying this is how it was for me and hopefully people will say well yeah they'll be encouraged to share that this was you know what it was like for them there was Nadia Kamis discussing her book titled off center and out of focus growing up colored in south africa